Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Lord bless us. The Lord bless us. Praise the name of Jesus. We give God thanks that we can come into his house where we can glorify the name of the Lord. I can sing of your love forever. God loves us. Amen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You know, that's a, the most popular verse of scripture in the Bible. And everybody knows that. And, you know, we memorize that scripture to the heart. But this scripture, there's a lot to it. God so loved the world that he gave. He gave his only son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are grateful. We are fortunate to have God giving us his only son. You know, to die on the cross of Calvary. Jesus didn't commit any sin. He was a, the sinless Lamb of God that was slain before the foundation of the world. And we are happy that the Lord is so gracious, so loving, so kind and compassionate towards us. Praise the Lord. I want to welcome everyone today to the house of the Lord, in the sanctuary of the Lord, where we can come and receive His blessing. Blessings from God. Amen. Today we will continue in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 1. Uh, and for you who are new, we, we, we are doing a verse-by-verse -verse study of the book of Timothy. We are in 2 Timothy chapter 1. This is how we operate in Straight Gate Ministries. We don't just come and pull a text from any part of the Bible and, you know, preach. You know, if a person wants to preach on a topic, they can do that. But I personally believe that the Lord called me to explain the Bible. To take one verse at a time and explain what the scripture is saying so that we can have a good understanding of what the word of God is saying to us. And today we are studying in Second Timothy. Second Timothy chapter one. Praise the Lord. Today we, we will pick up from verse 8 of 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8. But before we do that, we bow our heads in prayer. God, we are grateful to you for all of your blessings. Thank you that we can come together in your house and we can celebrate what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us. And God, we thank you because you have greater blessings in store for us. And even as we open up the word of God, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God shall man live. Even as Jesus declared that his will, oh God, his meat is to do the will of him that sent him and to finish his work. God, I pray our thirst and our desire, our hunger for the word of God will be developed today. We pray for showers of blessings. The windows of heaven will be open even as we... Open up the word today and the spirit of God will dispense to every heart, to every soul today. Oh God, your words, their Father, feed us with manna from above, we pray. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, God's Son. Praise the Lord. You know, um, we just want to pick up from what I was saying in Timothy, in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, in regards to Paul. The Apostle Paul writing this. 2 Timothy, or the book of Timothy, the epistle, which is um, Titus, 4th and 2 Timothy. And uh, the Apostle Paul, he was writing this uh, book from prison. And uh, he was a short distance away from being executed by the Roman authority, by the Roman government. And as I explained before, he was in a prison in the heart of the earth. He was in a hole. It was a 30 feet in diameter hole in the ground in Rome. It is called the Mamertine prison. And the Apostle Paul and other prisoners was in that hole. And Paul especially, he didn't know what was going to be his fate. But he knew that he was going to die. You know, and uh, he was just waiting for that time to come. It's like, you know, today we have parents who will you know, uh, experience sickness and disease in their life and the doctors give them a certain time period to live and they will call their children around their bedside and they will be, you know, talking to them and giving them their final testament, their final will and testament. 
And here we see the Apostle Paul, he was more or less on his deathbed and he was giving out to Timothy his final word. Final warning was given out by Paul to Timothy. And uh, he continued in verse 8 of chapter 1. He said, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of the Lord. Paul is saying here to Timothy, Timothy, I'm about to die. I'm going to lose my head. But I'm saying to you, don't be ashamed of the testimony of the Lord. Don't be ashamed to identify yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ. Last week we said that one of the ways that we are ashamed of the Lord is when we stay silent. You know, when we stay silent and we fail to represent the Lord. You know, we are in church and testimony service is going on. And you sit there and you want to get up and testify. But just like somebody just like they glue your bottom on the chair and you can't get up. And uh, you are afraid to get up and speak for the Lord. But uh, the Bible is telling us that if we are ashamed to own the Lord before our friends, that God, He will be ashamed, the Lord Jesus Christ will be ashamed to own us before His Father and His heavenly angel. So we need to share our vision that God has given to us, the uh, salvation that He has purchased and placed within our hearts. We need to share it. The Bible tells us that we overcome the enemy, the devil, by the word of our testimony and by the blood of the Lamb. The way we overcome Satan is when we testify, is when we say what God is doing in our lives. When you get up and you testify, you have a good chance of living up to your testimony. Because when you say something, for instance, you say, I am determined by the grace of God. You know, I'm no, I know that I'm a young person. And I'm going to try by the grace of God to live a pure life, a consecrated life. You know, in spite of all of the immorality that is in the world, when you are tempted to get into any kind of thing that is immoral, you will hear those words that you testify in church, it will ring out in your ears. Hallelujah. So it is very important that we are not ashamed to acknowledge ourselves, to stand up and say who we are. Hallelujah. We are children of God. We are sons and daughters of Almighty God. Hallelujah. So don't be ashamed, Timothy. Even though um, I, your um, uh, spiritual father, I am about to lose my life, don't be ashamed of the testimony of the Lord. The word of the Lord. We are not to be ashamed. We have to identify ourselves with the word of the Lord. Know of me, his prisoner. Paul is saying, I am in prison. And I'm in prison because I proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul was not in prison because he'd done something that was wrong. And there were people in the church who were ashamed of Paul because they were saying, well, the reason why he was in jail is because he had done something wrong. If he was innocent, God would have set him free. God would have delivered him. And you know, we have the same kind of mentality today in the church where sometimes you are, are sick and you have a, a, a sickness or disease that you are struggling with in your life. And you pray at different times. You know, people will go to different prayer lines. Some people will even travel from one country to the next, running down the praying evangelist, the healing evangelist, so that they can get a word from the Lord and get a word of healing. And still, sometimes you are not being healed. And people will, they will um, place all kinds of condemnation on individuals in that uh, situation. They will say, well, if you have enough faith, if you just believe, your faith is not strong enough. And how many times you hear people just become bitter on the inside. I heard this um, preacher was talking about his dad who had a, a terrible disease um, within his body and praying several times and believing God for healing. And uh, there's no healing being manifest in his life. And people will just taunt him when he go to church. If you really trust the Lord and if you really have faith, God is going to heal you. The, 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 the man becomes so bitter that he just stopped going to church. But we have to understand that sometimes things will happen in our life. And God allow it to happen because nothing can happen in the, ch 
in the life of a child of God unless God allow it. It doesn't matter how bad the thing is. Anything that happened in your life as a child of God, God allow it. Why? Because God is the only God. There is no other God beside Him. He is the Most High God. And because He is in total control, nothing can take place in this universe unless the Lord allow it. And you know, sometimes we try to cover up for God. And when bad things happen, we say, oh, it's Satan. And we blame Satan and we say, well, it's Satan that do this. Satan that caused the storm. Satan that caused the hurricane. And Satan that caused this and that. But nothing could happen in this universe unless God, who is the creator, he has to give the final okay. Hallelujah. He is not the one who is doing it, but he has to give permission. Because he's a sovereign God. So God allowed Paul to go in prison. And not just one time Paul was in prison. Several times he was in prison. God did not lift a finger to deliver him. God allowed him to go into prison. And today some Christians are so demanding and we become so bitter. When God don't become our bellboy and God don't show up and do exactly what we want him to do. But sometimes brethren we will have to go through the valley. Do I walk through the valley of the shadow of death? I will fear no evil. David, he found himself in the valley. And the Bible said, David, he was a man after God's own heart. He was God's man. Hallelujah. But there were times, many times, when he had to go through the valley. So brethren, when you go into the valley, never tell yourself that God forsake you. God don't forsake us when we go through the valley. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego... When they were cast into the, lake, into the burning, fiery furnace, God did not desert them. God did not um, stop them for, or prevent them from going into the, the burning, fiery furnace. They were before Shadrach, uh, for, be, before Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar was upset with them and he gave them a chance to recant and change their mind. And he let them know, I'm going to heat Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I'm going to heat the furnace seven times hotter than usual. He's telling them so that he will know what is going on. And these guys, you know, they have the opportunity to change their mind. And uh, God didn't, why didn't God stop Shed, uh, um, Nebuchadnezzar from heating up that furnace? Why didn't he kill those guys who decide to heat the furnace up? He didn't kill them before um, these uh, um, men of God, Shedrach, Meshach, and Abednego, was thrown into the furnace. God didn't prevent them. He didn't do anything. He allowed these men, men of God, to be cast into that furnace. Hallelujah. But in the midst of the furnace, the Bible talks about the fourth man. There was a fourth man and Nebuchadnezzar, he saw a fourth man and he said, I saw someone light on to the Son of God. And in the middle of that fire, right in all of the flame, the Lord Jesus Christ did not turn his back on Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He showed up in the midst of the flame. And when they came out, you know, um, Nebuchadnezzar had to plead with them, Shadrach, and Amer- Med- Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, come forth. <laughs> he had to call them out. <laughs> you know, he threw them into the furnace with haste. But when he see them inside it, the fire walking about, and there was a fourth man, he called them out, and these men walked out of the burning, fiery furnace. Not even the smell of, of fire or smoke was upon them. Hallelujah. So brethren... When you're going through terrible times and terrible situations, God is still with us. He said He will never. Anybody know the meaning of the word never? Never, never, never. No time in the world He is going to forsake us. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Glory be to God. So don't be ashamed of the Lord, nor of me, His prisoner. But be thou partaker of the affliction. Paul is saying to Timothy, join in with me. Don't be ashamed. Timothy, prepare. Because you could be next. Because Timothy also was killed. Paul was beheaded. The Roman soldier, um, not too long after this epistle was written, took uh, Paul out somewhere and they took that big sword or that big axe and they chopped the head of Paul off. And Timothy, he suffered uh, martyrdom also. So Paul is just preparing Timothy for what was ahead. He said, become a partaker. Join in with me. 
Hallelujah. Become, be, but be thou partaker of the affliction of the gospel. Today there is no affliction in the gospel. You can't talk about affliction in the gospel. Today the man of God, can't, he's not supposed to suffer. Man of God not supposed to feel no hardship. <laughs> if the man of God fingernail break, he have so many people in the church who are ready to put it back together. <laughs> you know, man of God can't fall apart. Man of God can't be like Humpy Dumpy up on the wall and Humpy Dumpy get a great fall. Man of God had to be put back together by the people. And, uh, you know, we put the man of God up on a pedestal and we don't expect any kind of suffering or any kind of trials or hard time to come in the life of the man of God. But the Apostle Paul, he was a man of God. And he was going through suffering. He was going through hardship. The word the affliction, it means um, trials and suffering, temptation, attack. Paul was attacked so many times. One time they beat him and they threw him over a wall and they stoned him. You know, they beat him with 39 stripes and uh, he was so abused by, by the people at times. But glory be to God, he didn't give up, he didn't quit. He didn't throw in the towel. He realized that this was a part of proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. Anybody who decides to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, they must expect that they will be tried, they will be tempted, they will suffer. Anybody who decides to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you may suffer in your life. And the Bible says, all those who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer tribulation, temptation, trials, and testing. We have to stop telling people, oh, you know, when you, if you become born again, your life is going to turn out to be so good. Everything is going to be so nice. God is going to work everything out for you. That is not no guarantee. There is no guarantee if you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior that your life is going to turn out uh, like a bed of roses. No, it's not, there's no guarantee about that. In the Old Testament, when Pharaoh went with the word of the Lord to, um, sorry, Moses went to Pharaoh with the word of the Lord and said, Thus said the Lord, set my people free. Pharaoh didn't set them free. Pharaoh, he made their life worse. He increased their workload. He used to give them the material to make bricks. He took away the material and he said, you have to go out there in the field and you have to find your own material. And not only that, I'm going to increase your workload. You have to produce more bricks. A word from the Lord to Pharaoh was rejected and the people um, suffering was intensified. So brethren, uh, Tim uh, Paul is preparing Timothy for what is ahead. He told him not to be ashamed. And he tell him to join in to become a partaker of, the, gospel, uh, uh, of the, the affliction of the gospel. Praise the Lord. According to the power of God. It's according to the power of God. He tells us in verse 9. Who had saved us? God is the one who saved us. The word save means to rescue. Amen. And we have to understand God don't just have the power to save. God have the power to save, but He have the power to keep. The same God who saved you is the same God who have the power to keep you. The Bible said, no one to Him that is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all the things that we should ask or think by the power of God that worketh in us. God is able to save, deliver, rescue, but He's able to keep. He's able to preserve. It doesn't matter what situation you are in, God can preserve you. I remember when I went to Trinidad years ago, I was just about 16 when I went to Trinidad. I didn't marry it or anything like that. So many girls around and Trinidad was so pretty at that time. There were so many girls in the church and, you know, guys who go after girls and they leave, uh, forsake, they become the backslide and stuff like that. And there was so much pressure that was on me. And sometimes when I go to work, those guys at work, they start teasing me and call your name and tell you you're going to go blind. If you don't have a girlfriend, you're going to go blind and all of that. You know, because they say if you're not having, that was the mentality back there, you're not having sexual relationship, you're gonna, the, you, 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 you become so overloaded that you'll either explore or you go blind and they write up all kind of things in the toilet, in the washroom. 
When I go to work, Eric is going to go blind because he don't have a girlfriend. I am under so much pressure, but I know that the God that I serve, he is going to preserve me. And God don't only save, but God can preserve. We don't have to mess ourselves up in the things that is going on in the world. Because God is more than able to keep, more than able to save, more than able to deliver. Hallelujah. So who had saved us and called us with a holy calling? God didn't just save us, he called us with a holy calling calling. In other words, he called us unto holiness. The Bible said, be holy even as our heavenly Father is holy. We have to live a life that is holiness in the sight of God. Romans 12, 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies unto God as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Brethren, we have to live a holy life, a devoted life, a consecrated life. That is pleasing in the sight of God. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Not only that he called us, but he said not according to our works. So we didn't do anything right for God to call us or save us. We couldn't perform any good works. It doesn't matter how much money you probably contribute to the church. That wasn't going to influence God to call you. It's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but by His mercy He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. It's by the grace of God why we are saved. Hallelujah. Grace, it means favor. It's because God favored us. The unmerited favor of God. Out of the unmerited favor of God, He decided to save us. Hallelujah. We don't deserve deserve salvation. None of us deserve to be saved. Hallelujah. So not according to our works, but according to his purpose. God have a plan for us. God have a purpose for us. God purpose for us and he planned for us. Hallelujah. His purpose and his grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. As I said last time, Our salvation is not an accident. God didn't just save us out of pity. You know, he looked down from heaven and see that things wasn't going good. After Adam and Eve um, messed up, God decided to save, um, you know, uh, mankind. Salvation was prepared and provided by God before the foundation of the world. Before Adam and Eve dreamed to sin, God had already provided salvation. Hallelujah. He had already chosen us. Before the foundation of the world. Not of anything good that we have done, but by His grace and by His mercy. In verse 10, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ. The word they appear, uh, um, manifest or appearing, it means to unveil, take off the veil. God removed the veil when Jesus Christ was manifest in the flesh. The word of God became flesh and dwell among us and we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten son of God, Jesus. He was the light. He shines. Hallelujah. And God allowed his glory to be revealed. Glory be to God. But it's now made manifest, uh, 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 made manifest, praise the Lord, by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who had abolished death. You know, there's a popular saying that everything in this world has an expiry date. And it is true. You know, even uh, us as human beings, we have an expiry date. (laughs) But we don't know when our expiry date is. And uh, the, 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 the thing that will come in and cause us to expire is called death. But you know, according to the Bible, if you understand what the Bible is saying here, death also has an expiry date. God has already set an expiry date for death. When death will lose its sting, death will lose its power, death will become impotent. Hallelujah. Death will have no more dominion, no more control. Paul said, oh death, where is thy sting? Oh grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who have given us a victory through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ have abolished death. 
you know, people still die, but the time will come where death will uh, be extinct. And the Bible tells us that hell and death will be cast into the lake of fire. And not only that, death will come to an end and lost its sting and lost its power. He said, and had brought life and immortality, divine life, the Zoe of God, quality of life, hallelujah. Immortality means that you cannot, uh, something that can't be corrupted, something that can't suffer death, can't suffer pain. That body that we are going to receive from the Lord, that glorified body, when the Bible said the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and the voice of his archangel and the trump of God shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain unto the end, we shall be caught up to meet him in the air. Glory be to God, we will receive that glorified body, that body that cannot suffer pain or death, suffer any kind of a grief. Hallelujah. You know, many times you hear people talk about the riches of the gospel. If you want to talk about riches in the gospel, you have to talk about immortality. You have to talk about um, life. You have to talk about Jesus abolishing death. Those are the riches of the gospel. The riches of the gospel is not material things. The riches of the gospel is things that you can't buy with money. You can't buy eternal life with money. You can't buy immortality with money. These things are priceless. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Verse 11, where unto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. So Paul, as I said, he's, he's not afraid to identify himself with the Lord. He's still a preacher. He's still God's man. Right in that hole in the ground in prison. Paul didn't get upset. He still identified himself as a man of God. A man of God who will, may not make it out of that hole. He's going to lose his head. But he's not ashamed to identify himself. To say he's still God's man. He's still God's representative. Glory be to God. He's still that one that was sent by God. He's still a teacher of the Gentile. Verse 12. For the which cause I also suffer these things. So because he was appointed a preacher and an apostle. Because he decided to carry out the mandate that God had placed upon him. He was suffering. He wasn't suffering because he was guilty of anything. Paul was suffering. He was in jail because he was preaching the good news of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I think today if many of us as ministers of the gospel of Jesus get back to the foundation of preaching the word in season and out of season, rightly dividing the word of God, some suffering will start to take place in the life of some of us as ministers. But today we don't want to hear about suffering. So therefore we will just preach the thing that people want to hear. And when you just preach to tickle the ears of people, you don't have any suffering to come from that. But look in the scripture and you will see where these men of God in the, in the Bible preach the truth of God's words. And they suffer, suffer even unto death. Hallelujah. Brethren, we are privileged. We don't have anything to complain about. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. For this um, cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. Paul said even though he was suffering, he was not ashamed. Meaning that he wasn't going to give up. He wasn't going to quit. He wasn't going to give up, the, um, uh, throw in the towel. He wasn't upset with God. He wasn't complaining. He wasn't griping. Could you imagine if it was some of us today in the body of Christ? You know, you call yourself a Christian and you're in jail and you're preaching. You know, before you go in jail, you were preaching. Even while Paul was in jail, he was preaching too. He didn't give up. And uh, could you imagine this happening to some of us today? We will throw in the towel. We will quit. We will curse God. But Paul didn't give in. He said, even though he was suffering these things, he was not ashamed. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. I am not going to quit. I am not going to give up. For I know whom I have believed. This is very important. He said, I know. He know by experience. He had an experience with God. 
And you know today the church needs an experience. Members in the church need to have an experience with God. Where we can testify like the Apostle Paul. I know for I know whom I have believed. And that word they believe means to trust. Means to lean on. He know who he commit his life to. And I'm persuaded. The word persuade means to win over. It's when somebody win you over. And Paul is saying that God, uh, Jesus won him over. He's on Jesus' team. So because he's on Jesus' team, he's not going to quit. He's not going to give up. He's fully persuaded that he is able to keep. As I said before, God is not um, in the, only in the saving business, but he's in the keeping business. He's able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. So the Apostle Paul commits his life in the hand of God. And God, you know, is able to keep that which Paul commits in his hand. And brethren, it's the same thing today. When we commit our life in the hands of God, God is able to keep that which we have committed unto him against that day. What day? The day of judgment. You know, we're not hearing a whole lot today about the Day of Judgment. You know, a lot of people say, oh, when I'm dead, I'm done, and there is nothing after death. The Bible tells us it's appointed on the man once to die. But after death, there comes the judgment. The Day of Judgment is coming. Judgment is surely coming, coming for you and me. Brethren, we have to be ready. We have to be prepared. We have to get ourselves right with God. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. In verse 13, he said, hold fast the form of sung words. Paul is saying to Timothy, hold fast the form or the image. That word they form, it means image. It means the image. Hold fast that image. Hold fast the original thing. The word is sung. It's a medical term. It means to be healthy, wholesome. Hold fast doctrine that is healthy wholesome. You know, as I read this um, verse of scripture where he said to hold fast to sound doctrine. You know, my understanding here, brethren, I am not looking for anything new from God. I am not, I'm going to say it again, I am not looking for anything new from God. And when you say that, you know, some people, you know, will not like to hear that because everybody today wants something new from God. I am not looking for anything exciting and anything new from God. Hallelujah. Because the thing is, if it's new, the way how you identify if something comes from God, if it's new, it's not true. Anything that comes from God is not new. If it's true, it is not new. And if it's new, it is not true. So all of these new things that we have going on in the church is not from God. Hallelujah. If it's not recorded in the Word of God, it is not from God. A lot of people today, all they want to get, I want to hear something new. I want to hear some new revelation. I want to hear a new word from God. There is no new word from God. The corner of Scripture already closed. God is not giving out any new word. Everything that we need to hear from God is already written in the Word of God. Hallelujah. This is the word of God that is given to us. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. And we have to be content. We have to satisfy with what the Lord has given to us. So don't look for anything new. Everything that God has already promised to us, He has already given to us. Hallelujah. Everything, uh, the Bible says, all of the promises of God in Christ Jesus are yea and amen. They are already been given. Hallelujah. Hold fast the form of some words which thou hast heard from me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. So you have to hold it in faith. Trusting. Loving it. Loving the word of God. Put your faith and your trust and your confidence in the word of God. And uh, the, 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 the ability to do that is in Christ Jesus. Verse 14. That good thing which was committed on to be keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. The good thing here that Paul is talking about. Excuse me.
the good thing that Paul is talking about here, in verse 14, that good thing which was committed unto thee keep by the Holy Ghost, which is which dwelleth in us, it is the gospel message. It is a good thing. And that the gospel, the gospel that was committed to us, brethren, it is under threat today. You know, and we have to, we have to protect this good gospel. There's so much of bad teaching and bad doctrine and bad interpretation that is in the body of Christ today. People today just want their ears to be tickled and they just want to hear something good coming from the pulpit. But the Word of God is able to heal. The Word of God is able to cut. Hallelujah. And the brethren, we have to keep that good message, that powerful teaching that the Lord commits to the Apostle Paul and the rest of the Apostle. We have to keep it going. We have to secure it. We have to protect it. Hallelujah. This thou knowest, in verse 15, that all they which are in Asia be torn away from me, of whom is uh, Philegus and uh, Hormoninus. These two leaders in the church, I can't pronounce the name <laughs> so good. These two guys torn away from the Apostle Paul because he was in jail. And uh, <laughs> here we see that the Apostle Paul was under fire and he was going through a uh, uh, tribulation and testing. And here we see that the leaders who were supposed to embrace him and surround him, they turned their back on him. Brethren, when the pastor of the church going through trials and tribulation, that is not the time for us to turn our back on him. Especially when the attack that he's facing is false and coming from people who just bring in accusation against him. The Bible says we should not believe any word against a leader except you get it from two or three reliable witnesses. You know, sometimes people just want to hear something bad about their leader so that they can start tearing him down. When people are trying to attack leaders in the church, it is time for us as members of the congregation to embrace our leaders. But what we are seeing in the body of Christ today, when a leader or a good pastor is under attack, most of the time the congregation stays silent. When your pastor is under attack, especially you know that's a man of God, that is not the time for you to stay silent. You need to defend him and say, this is not true. I have not proven this about this man. Instead of we try to tear him down and we, we criticize and we listen to what people are saying. We, we surround him and we embrace him. Hallelujah. Not only for pastors, but for other members of the church. Other brothers and sisters. Somebody saying something about a brother or sister. You don't listen to it and tear them down and agree with what they're saying. You have to get foundation truth. You have to get proof that what this person is saying is true. Before you agree with them. Hallelujah. So we have to um, embrace our leaders. We are coming to an end. The Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus. For he oft refreshed me <clears throat> and was not ashamed of my chain. So Paul is saying that God should give a blessing to this guy's household, his family, because he refreshed Paul. When Paul was in jail, he wasn't ashamed of him. Hallelujah. In verse 17 he said, But when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently and found me. Could you imagine that? This guy went to the big city Rome. And Rome was where the action was. Where the spotlight was. But even though he was in Rome, and they say when you're in Rome, you have to do, what, do as the Romans do. <laughs> he still had time to go in that hole, in that pit where Paul was. And the Bible says he sought him out diligently. The word diligent means to stretch. It means to stretch as far as possible and try to reach out to something. This man reached out to the Apostle Paul. And you know, as I read this verse, it makes me uh, understand that you know who is your friend when you are in jail. And this person will come and look for you and visit you or even try to get you out. You know who, who is your friend when you are in a pit. 
and you see somebody reaching down their hand, and sometimes they can't, their hand not long enough to reach, and they try to throw a piece of stick down there, or throw a, a rope down there so that they can pull you out. You know when you are, uh, you have friends, when you are in these difficult situations, and somebody trying to help you. Hallelujah. Your enemy is not going to come in the pit to pull you out. Anybody who come to help you when you're in the pit is your friend. Hallelujah. Paul was in a pit. And this guy was in Rome. Busy place. Hallelujah. And he find time to go in that pit so that he can visit the Apostle Paul. That's the reason why Paul had to ask the Lord to bless his household. Pronounce blessing upon him. And, you know, anybody who helped an ex person, God is going to bless him. The Bible says it is more blessed to give than to receive. You know, sometimes all we want, we just want people to give to us. But we have to give, we have to reach out, we have to be diligent, we have to stretch, we have to reach down in the pit and pull people out. Hallelujah. In closing, the Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord. In that day, we are talking about that day again. Brethren, this is the day that is important. We today, we esteem all kind of day. Our birthday. People forget your birthday, you want to cut their throat. People forget your anniversary. You know, you want to cut their throat. The wedding day. We esteem all of these days. Yes, they are important. But there is a day that is above every other day. Hallelujah. That day that is to come. When the Bible tells us that every man, boy and girl will stand before God. And there will be a book open and another book. And out of these books, all of the dead, both small and great, will have to give an account before the Lord. And whosoever name was not found written in the book of life, the Bible said, will be cast into the lake of fire. So in 18, in closing, the Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy. Mercy, this is one of the other riches that the Lord have here for us. Mercy is when God didn't give us what we deserve. God give one is for us mercy. And brethren, we need mercy from God. Hallelujah. Of the Lord in that day. And in how many things he ministered unto me at Ephesus. Thou knowest very well. God bless us. Praise the Lord. I'm going to ask the musicians to come back. <clears throat> we'll put up a song on the board, Your Grace and Mercies. At the end of this song, anybody need a prayer? Anybody in need a prayer and you want to come forth, you can do so. If you, you know, find yourself as if, well, you're in a pit, you're in a hole in the ground, like the Apostle Paul, God is still in the rescuing business. God is still in the deliverance business. He's still able to save and he's able to keep. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Let us all stand as we sing this song.